Welcome, everyone. Please join us. Um, we're here on the Engineering for the SDGs workshop, Insights from the 2020 InfoC Fellowship. Uh, my name is Mariela Machado, and I'm Program Manager at, here at ASME and Engineering for Change, two of the co-hosts of this event. I just want to remind everyone uh, about Engineering for Change, and if you haven't checked it out, we really invite you to uh, become a member and subscribe. Engineering for Change is a, a knowledge organization and an online community of over one million individuals that believe that engineering can change the world. E4C's mission is to prepare, educate, and activate the international engineering workforce to solve the most pressing challenges of the world and to improve quality of life of underserved communities. We do this by providing products, resources, and platforms um, that enable this to happen. But we also have a variety of programs um, that are targeted at, and aligned to this mission. One of the most critical and one of our main programs at Engineering for Change is called the E4C Research Fellowship, as, you, as you're seeing on the screen. This is one of our core programs because it's really aligned to our mission, the one that I just explained before, to prepare and educate that international engineering workforce. Our program is a highly competitive program where we're aim at uh, uh, training the workforce um, all over the world. As you see in the map, we have awarded uh, 86 fellowships in 24 countries. Uh, this is our workforce development program, as I, as I mentioned before, to train these engineers to become top leaders uh, in their space and to keep working to solve these challenges locally and globally, and hopefully achieve those SDGs. I just want to highlight before I move on, and, and this slide here, uh, the next slide that I'm showing, is around data from the 2020 cohort because I want to introduce our fellows in the best way possible. We had 423 applicants in 72 countries. And as you can see below, below our recruitment avenues are very targeted. So we do university one-on-one -on -one, um, partnerships. We do on the E4C website, but you need to sign up. And if you're interested in this opportunity after this workshop or, or beyond, you please visit uh, the fellowship, the E4C fellowship um, page on our website, and you can sign up to learn more. Uh, we also uh, do recruitment through ACME, uh, conference and, and events that, that they have, like EFEST, um, and international partnerships in general. Um, out of this 423, we selected 25 individuals. Can, as you can see here, it's so competitive. This 25 that got selected as are highly qualified and are just rock stars from 15 different countries. You will meet some of them now shortly. But before I move on uh, to the actual research that you're here to learn more about, I just want to provide context to what that means. The fellows, uh, during their five-month period and work with us, it's a part-time opportunity. They work with us uh, for five months, um, and they do research on our behalf. And, and I just want to um, be sure that I explain that the E4C research collaborations cut across geographies and sectors. As you see here, we tackle uh, many of the SDGs that you're seeing on the right. Um, and it's, an ecosystem, it's meant to provide an ecosystem perspective of technology for good. We're really wanting to bridge the gaps between the academics doing their work, between the development practitioners that are on, in the field, between the policymakers, between the private sector companies that are doing R&D. And we want to provide all of this and put it into context. So the fellows that we select uh, are, are matched to this uh, very specific topics that come to us through our research partners. And I want to give a huge shout out here and thank all the partners that supported us uh, this year. And you see there that we have private sector, we have academia, we have nonprofits, and they are also from every, every corner of the world. Uh, these topics are then researched and, and, and all the insights are collected uh, through our fellows um, and we publish those and we are really hoping and, and I mean that's usually our target after we develop this research is to really put this in the hands of the policymakers, the implementers so that we can have actionable plans and achieve the SDGs. So before uh, having said all of this and really not wanting to lose any more time, I want to introduce you to our incredible um, forever fellow, Grace. Um, Grace is a PhD student, uh, a student in design science at the University of Michigan, but she has been a fellow with us for the past four years. And something that I want to highlight is that during for our fellowship program, we have 
tiers of fellowship. So the fellows that were this year fellows have the opportunity then to become kind of the supervisors of the fellows for next year and become and also increase their opportunities, you know, to manage people, to learn about program management. So the the, the fellowship can really last a couple of years if you're interested in, in, in working with us. Grace is the best example of that. She excels in everything she does, and I'm super proud to present her. She's a research manager for this year, and she has been our junior program manager, expert fellows, and uh, expert fellow and fellow. So, without further ado, say I want to introduce you to Grace. Grace, welcome, and thank you uh, for joining us. Thank you so much, Mariella. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited to share um, more about what the fellows have been working on in 2020. Um, I'll start off by talking about the, um, the approach that we take. All of our research collaborations first start off with detailed desk research. This includes academic articles, but also news articles, white papers, and even policy briefs. Um, next, fellows supplement their review with semi-structured interviews with key experts. Um, we use the E4C and the ASME network, as well as the networks of our partner collaborators um, to identify who these experts are and get a hold of them and uh, perform an interview. Uh, this year, our fellows met and collected insights from over 160 practitioners um, and academics and policymakers and so on. Um, we know a lot of you who participated in the interviews are actually here watching this session, so feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, as Mariella mentioned, uh, we will be, um, we really think that using a multidisciplinary approach is key when investigating uh, these topics that cut across sectors. At Impact Engineered this year, you're probably hearing a lot about the Sustainable Development Goals, which have a deadline set by the UN for 2030. This year, our research collaborations aim to address some of the gaps that exist towards reaching these goals. We don't have time to discuss all 17, but we will highlight key insights from our fellows for these seven goals specifically. First, we'll start with goal number two, zero hunger. Target 2.3 aims to double agricultural productivity and incomes of small-scale food producers. This year, fellows investigated sustainable energy and technology, particularly in post-harvest and agro-processing. Importantly, fellows investigated food packaging and materials to provide recommendations for less energy-intensive alternatives. Reducing waste throughout the agricultural value chain is also very important. I first want to welcome two of the fellows who worked on a project in collaboration with Feeding Tomorrow Foundation and the University of Missouri. First, we have Bezalel Adino. He is an agriculture fellow from Ghana, presently working remotely with Prescouter, which is a research company based in Chicago. Welcome, Bez. Thank you for having me. And Jonathan Kemp also worked on this project. He's a fellow um, in energy and agriculture from the UK, currently working in Malawi as a technical manager for Eagles Relief and Development Program, a local NGO there. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks. It's great to be here and to bring some of the sounds of Malawi with me in the background. <laughs> Great. Um, so tell us more um, about the issue that your team explored. Certainly. Uh, so our team investigated the current state of mango post-harvest losses in Kenya and mapped out the value chain to identify the choke points with substantial losses, as well as technologies that can help to reduce post-harvest mango losses. Uh, I'll add that our partners feeding tomorrow foundation and the University of Missouri supported us in identifying this topic. Kenya is a leading producer of mango in Africa, producing over a million tons of mango each year. But they lose approximately 40 to 50 percent of the mango they produce post harvest. And harvest practices vary from county to county. Kenya is divided into various counties. However, the general it was generally noted that the mangoes moved from farmers to traders or brokers or cooperatives then on to both uh, local and foreign fresh mango markets or processes, and then finally to the consumers. 
That's great. Can you tell us um, where these different losses of mangoes occur across the value chain? Yes, so we, we gathered that the losses occur in different points in the value chain. First, poor harvesting and handling techniques account for about 13% of the total losses. Next, improper packing of mangoes for transportation results in additional 5-7% of the total losses. Uh, and, and this results in bruising of the mangoes in the process, hence the losses. And then additionally, there, was, there is a lack of adequate storage technologies in the local mango market, contributing to up to about 10% of the total losses. Oh, wow. So after you identified these different choke points, um, you know, you looked into a lot of different technologies to reduce the mango losses. Can you speak about, about that process and what you found? Sure, I can do that. Um, so we found that there are various different technologies available to reduce post harvest loss of mangoes in Kenya and globally, but that not all technologies are appropriate or suitable for each different user. Um, in addition, most technologies are designed for a specific purpose, uh, whether that's cooling, storage, juicing, or many other purposes. Um, and this presents different actors in the sector with a challenge um, to identify which technologies, are, which technologies are actually suitable for them um, and which technologies can help them in, uh, in their work. Can you share about um, the different ways you looked um, to help these different actors address uh, their challenges with technologies? Yeah, of course. Um, so we performed a comparison of different technologies uh, to create an output indicating which technologies are most suitable for different value chain actors. Um, and th this is to help users quickly identify which technologies will meet their needs and select those technologies that will be most beneficial for them. Uh, and we did this by first classifying technologies into categories based on their purpose, and then tabulating different types of technologies within those categories. Uh, for some, there are machines that perform different parts of a process um, as different types. So, for example, juice extractors and pasteurizing machines both help in the juicing process, but are clearly different. Um, and for other categories, it's just where there's similar technologies that are very different um, in terms of cost or capacity. For example, tunnel solar dryers um, used for dehydrating mangoes process many fewer mangoes per day than a freeze dryer or an oven dryer. They also produce a much lower quality output of dried mango, but they're substantially cheaper both in capital and operational costs, and so more appropriate for a small cooperative looking to start drying their mangoes um, instead of a large-scale commercial processor. Excellent. I know you mainly focused on the needs in Kenya, but can you share some of the broader outcomes from this research collaboration? Yes, we believe our approach for mapping the value chain and performing a technology comparison can be applied more broadly to other sectors like the energy sector or the water sector. Comparing and categorizing the different technologies that seem to meet a specific need can help to make all the value chain actors more efficient through more informed decision making. Also, it will be helpful to funders and policymakers to direct their efforts efficient, effectively, whether through creation of enabling environments or opening up new opportunities for assessing these technologies. Wonderful. Thanks, Des and Jonathan. Moving along to goal number three, good health and well-being. Target 3D aims to strengthen the capacity of all countries for early warning risk reduction and management of the global health risks. I think this target brings to mind an extremely relevant global health risk, COVID-19. This year, as our largest team of researchers, fellows developed a catalog of over 140 standards and resources for rapid engineering response to this global pandemic, including certifications for ventilators, contact tracing apps, and best practices, and key hygiene and hand washing um, technology and protocols. Additionally, our fellows interviewed engineers from around the world who have been responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Makerspaces in Ghana quickly created hubs for PPE production and private partnerships such as that between Ford Motor Company and GE Healthcare joined forces for rapid technology development. 
Governments also responded to varying degrees, including vaccine development funding, contact tracing apps, rapid testing, and so on. Next, SDG 6 aims to address um, access to clean water and sanitation by 2030. This goal aims to achieve um, adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene um, for all and end open defecation, paying special attention to the needs of women and girls in particularly vulnerable situations. Um, there has been a lot of engineering and innovation put into water and sanitation technologies. This year, fellows explored ways to select and compare technologies for context-specific applications. Fellows aggregated household water treatment decision-making frameworks to develop key list of considerations um, for practitioners during needs assessment um, stages of their implementation. Okay, now let's welcome two of our sanitation fellows, Dr. Jonathan Treslove and Thomas De Jose. I'd like to invite both of you to introduce yourselves. Hi, Grace. Thanks very much for having us. Uh, I'm Dr. Jonathan Treslove. I'm a research associate in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland. I've worked a number of WASH projects uh, in the past, including sustainability across the life cycle of rural water supply infrastructure in Malawi. And currently, I'm involved with a program to improve the use and quality of wastewater going into the environment from the streets of Glasgow. Thanks, Grace and JT. I'm Thomas De Jose. I'm a civil engineering graduate from the University of Technology, Sydney. I'm currently a project manager at ACOM, working in the delivery of public infrastructure, but also the co-founder of Macy Consultants, a social enterprise based in the Philippines, involved in making um, wash services safe and accessible for all communities. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. Uh, you both worked on a research collaboration with uh, Engineers Without Borders Australia. Tell us about your project. Yeah, of course, a little bit of context. So our project was based in Cambodia, which has a 100% improved sanitation coverage target by around 2025. And poor flush latrines are a recommended solution to meet that target. And in rural Cambodia, there are a number of challenges associated with sanitation. Um, so Challenging environments such as hard rock make it difficult and costly to construct conventional poor flush latrines, but are also a contamination risk to drinking water resources and the surrounding environment. So the purpose of our research collaboration was to evaluate sanitation technologies that were suitable for hard rock environments while ruling out traditional approaches such as those poor flush latrines. Mm, excellent. How did you approach investigating solutions to this problem? Um, we conducted a variety of desk research, which looked into hard rock as a challenge environment, the legislation and policy of rural sanitation in Cambodia, as well as emerging themes of existing sanitation solutions suitable for hard rock environments. This was, of course, supplemented by semi-structured interviews with 11 experts, including academia, NGO, and consultancies to help deepen our understanding. And yes, yeah, so after that, we had to look at where hard rock might be a notable issue in Cambodia. So we found it wasn't commonly encountered. However, hard clay and soils that present the similar problems as hard rock were more common. So collectively, this could be known as a hard ground challenging environment. Uh, so next, we had to look at what technologies existed globally and available in Cambodia for sanitation. And we found a number of emerging themes to mediate the challenges of hard rock, such as watertight controlled leaching or waterless containment of sanitation and sanitation that was constructed above hard ground levels or above the water table to avoid that contamination pathway. What was interesting was we found a number of technologies that fit these themes. They're already well established in Cambodia and they tackle and are marketed towards other challenging environments. So this includes regions that are prone to flooding or regions with floating communities. So solutions that are already well established and marketed for other challenging environments in Cambodia are also suitable and could be used to aid the hard rock challenging environment. So Thomas, would you like to speak on how we evaluated these technologies? Of course. So our priority focus of our research project was the development of an easy to use selection criteria that was composed of key physical and social cultural conditions. This tool was designed to support solution providers and organizations in recommending sanitation options that met the needs and profiles of target households, noting that these, these needs do vary. And then the tool would also aid households as well in their own decision-making process to understand which sanitation technology is best suited to their condition. Thank you so, uh, so much for sharing. In your report where you 
describe this tool, you also um, mentioned the importance of scaling these technologies. What were some of the key drivers that you identified? Yep, we identified five key drivers from our research. These are the first being behavior change from authentication and conducting vehicle sludge management to community engagement. Second being financial subsidies from public and private partnerships. Third being making the use of existing capacity in supply chains. Fourth being household considerations beyond affordability that make improved sanitation an aspirational product for households. And of course, the fifth being in monitoring and valuation to ensure continual improvement based on evidence-based decision-making. We do believe that these lessons learned will help organizations and the sector as a whole to really scale their impact. Um, any final words, JT, would you like to share? Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Um, so these lessons learned from our research can aid decision maker, makers in the sector, improve the sustainability and uptake of sanitation solutions um, at the local level. So when we're looking towards the decade of action, we're required to accelerate our efforts towards achieving the SDGs. But this also must consider the sanitation solutions are, that are used to increase the access are appropriate for the environment, but are also accessible and affordable to those most underserved. All right. Thanks, guys, so much. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thanks, JT. Next, an SDG of utmost relevance to the engineering community is goal number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Target 9.1 aims to develop quality, reliable, sustainable, and resilient infrastructure. This year, fellows mapped out the importance of both soft and hard infrastructure, particularly for digital solutions, for example, in our partnership with Huawei and iGov Africa. Um, hard infrastructure refers more to the built environment, like roads, electricity, um, whereas soft infrastructure refers to other key resources for innovation, like innovation hubs and financial services. Fellows explored this need um, for infrastructure by mapping out landscape analysis of social enterprise incubators in the United States, and also by exploring the needs of social entrepreneurs and innovators in the Middle East and North Africa region. Next, we'll present some highlights from our research collaboration with the American University of Beirut. I want to welcome Haula Trigi, who is from Tunisia and works as an aeronautical engineer in Germany. Haula, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Grace. Can you tell us about this research collaboration? Um, what was the motivation? So this research collaboration with the American University of Beirut is about energy, water, food, innovation in the Middle East, North Africa region, MENA region. So MENA is one of the world's most water scarce regions. This issue related with water is even accentuated now with the climate change impact on the region and will be even more in the future. How do we consider those, uh, those three sectors? We consider them as a nexus, because if we take every sector in silo, if we consider every sector in silo, we would not have sustainable development in the long term. To do this research, we started by doing desk research. Then we interviewed 27 in innovators using different networks and databases of startups in the region. Wow, 27 innovators, that's a lot of insights. Um, what are the various technologies that you're seeing to address this nexus in the region? The trends in technologies uh, are various. They included agriculture technologies, water treatment, waste management, and solar energy. So the most common trend is using technologies applied to agriculture, agritech. Those technologies, they range from innovative irrigation methods, fertilizers, aquaponics, to ICT applied to agriculture using IoT and AI. Other technologies included solutions for water treatment with plant filters or water efficiency using ICT. Waste management was also present as a, as a technology, but it was less popular among the interviewees. Um, in all those Product solar energy was either integrated as a power source or planned to be integrated. All the technologies were mainly driven by the needs of the local communities and the experience of the innovators. Unfortunately, there is a clear gap between this innovation and the local entrepreneurship ecosystem. 
Aside from those technology trends, we identified barriers and challenges. First, we found out that the access to finances and markets is quite difficult in the region. Second, about the sustainability, all the innovators were aware about the sustainability and the impact they are having with their product. But it seemed that the efforts that they are doing were not fully recognized or supported in the region. There is sometimes a lack of awareness around sustainability issues in the country, and this seemed to be a challenge for the innovators. Further, um, yeah, and finally, just missing the proper research and development infrastructure is also discouraging those innovators from pursuing their goals inside their local countries. Mm. Wow, that's a lot of different challenges. What do you think are um, some of the different ways to address these and then also encourage innovation in the MENA region? So we found out a lot of things. Among them, first one was the access to finances and markets. So it is quite challenging in the region, as I already mentioned, but it should be encouraged and supported by the local governments and the private sector there. Many indicators within the SDG 9 are aimed at granting access to markets uh, to small scale enterprises. And we believe this is very important to be addressed in MENA. Another very important finding linked to this SDG is also the research and development. Being a challenge in the region, it should be considered as a part, rather as a part of this enabling environment. So all of the innovators that we interviewed, they showed a high interest in research and development and a willingness to do R&D, but they were not supported. And by promoting research and development at policy level first and building the necessary human capitals, those countries would benefit from very skilled researchers who would thrive and innovate in their local countries. And finally, about sustainability. So policymakers should also encourage and give proper incentives to sustainability. And also they should raise awareness around sustainability as a topic inside the communities by changing the mindsets and shifting towards more sustainable behaviors. One of our recommendations to the decision makers is to try monitoring the uh, indicators of SDG 9 and work on those goals with the innovators themselves. They should be part of the process of policy making. Some countries in the region are already integrating those valuable feedbacks from the innovators and using them to build proper frameworks. For example, Tunisia and Egypt are already having startup frameworks with also the help of the innovators who participated in building this framework. So this is just a first step towards more innovation in the water, energy, food sector. And to finish uh, this, this discussion, I would like to say that we found out from our research that there, are, there is a lot of innovation and entrepreneurship spirit in the MENA region. And it was very nice to see this willingness to innovate in the region. So we call all the local policymakers and the governments and the private sector to support this spirit, this entrepreneurship, and to bring in more innovation into the region. Wow, great. Hala, thank you so much. And I know you have so much more insights and recommendations in your report. So just as a reminder to the audience, all these different research collaborations that you're hearing about are being published on the E4C research platform. And then also, if you have any questions, as any of the um, presenters have um, described what they've done, please feel free to type those in the chat and they will respond. Thanks. Next, we will focus on sustainable development goal number 12, responsible consumption and production. Um, specifically, targets 12.5 and 12.6 aim to reduce waste reduction and encourage companies to adopt sustainable practices. I'm excited to welcome two more fellows who worked with Autodesk on a research collaboration this summer, Elizabeth Collins and Dana Shua. Tell us more about yourselves. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth from Scotland. 
I have a degree in mechanical engineering and my work experience has mostly been in manufacturing engineering with Cummins. I joined E4C as a transport fellow this summer. I am currently living in Spain, working remotely and improving my Spanish. Hello, my name is Diana and I'm from the United States. I have a degree in mechanical engineering and I'm currently working on my master's in sustainability from Stanford University. I'm currently working at Tesla as a technical program manager intern for the industrial battery program and was previously an energy fellow for our E4C. Excellent, thank you. Um, tell us about your research collaboration with Autodesk. So our research focuses on sustainable development opportunities in the engineering design and manufacturing industry. So as a little bit of background, there are currently so many opportunities for the industry to improve their sustainability efforts. Currently, Autodesk, our research collaboration partner, offers various simulation tools such as computer-aided design, CAD, and it's one way for designers to improve their manufacturing efficiency by reducing waste and minimizing energy in their design. However, there's a lot of reasons companies are becoming more sustainable. Overall, there's a variety of standards, yet there isn't one gold standard across these companies. So we wanted to investigate what else, other than the standards, might be driving these sustainability efforts in companies. That's excellent and super relevant. Um, how did you go about assessing what drives these companies to consider sustainability outcomes? In addition to desk research, where we mapped out existing standards and practices, I used connections from the ASME and Autodesk networks to identify experts to interview. We conducted, uh, we connected with eight leaders across universities and leading manufacturers and consumer technology companies. When talking with these experts, some of the most notable most motivations were regulations, customers, competition, and social values. It seems like one of the most effective ways to push companies to be more sustainable is increasing regulations. We heard how even local and national regulations can have global influence, as it's not uncommon for larger international companies to bring their standards up to match the toughest regulations in the world just for consistency. Uh, of course, companies can lobby against stricter regulations, and we did hear that enforcement of the laws could do with improvement. But generally speaking, it was accepted that regulations do push companies to do better. I'll also add that with customers, we found business to business interactions to be really important. And big companies have a lot of leverage over their suppliers and can pressure them into change. And when one company is seen as changing, then the others don't want to feel left behind. And that's where the competition aspect comes in. The ideal situation is where companies sort of team up to push the industry in general to become more sustainable. We also found that concerns around social impact seem to be growing, possibly motivated by current climate related events, which reminds what is um, us of what is at stake. And some companies rely on their reputation for doing the right thing. And this can act as a strong internal motivator for change. Things like cost cutting and shareholder demands were also cited as drivers, but seem to be less important. Cost was often a higher concern for the engineers that we spoke to, and some of the cost cutting initiatives translated into positive environmental impacts, such as reducing waste. But it seems company wide sustainability initiatives are often stated, started not primarily for cost reduction. Mm, excellent. What would you say is a, a recommendation um, that follows from this research? So from our research, we found several major classes of changes that needed to happen. We found that there was a need for communication, collaboration, and sharing of product lifecycle information across companies. Recommendations include increasing reporting and communication between companies. A common critique we found throughout our research was that voluntary standards are often not specific enough in the criteria and expectations for products. They're often scoped to product end of life metrics instead of design considerations. Um, this can lead to a similar issue of companies avoiding the process of challenging and reimagining the design process. In order to make true progress toward designing a more sustainable future, companies must be transparent and consistent in how they present sustainability information. Great, thank you both. Moving along to goal 13, it's clear that climate action cuts across many of the SDGs that we have been talking about. Target 13.1 aims to strengthen resilience and adaptive capacity to climate related hazards and natural disasters, which are increasing in frequency and severity due to climate change. In 2018, nearly 40 million people were affected by natural disasters. This year, fellows explored how innovation can be used to enhance ecological resilience in Uganda, with particular emphasis on 
prioritization of indigenous knowledge and perspectives. Fellows also identified interventions for flood risk reduction in Kenya and Tanzania by mapping out various context-specific solutions. They followed a very similar process to uh, the one you heard previously by the fellows who explored mango processing. The last SDG that we will highlight today is number 17, Partnerships for the Goals. Target 17 aims to enhance regional and international cooperation on and access to science, technology, and innovation and enhance knowledge sharing. This is key, especially since currently many of these sectors and fields are working um, in largely siloed uh, organizations. This year, through a series of interviews with ICT practitioners and experts, our fellows identified communities with different taxonomies and categorizations of technologies, and that there's ample opportunity for enhanced knowledge sharing in this particular sector. In E4C's State of Engineering for Global Development reports, we've aimed to catalog various actors and organizations within the academy that work in the sector, with the hopes that this will provide a place of information that's all in one spot. Um, last year, we published reviews for the EGD programs in North America, Australia, and New Zealand, and this year we're excited to publish reviews of Latin America and Asia as well. It is clear that partnerships are essential to advancing the various targets and goals that we have discussed today. I will pass it now back to Mariella for closing remarks for the session. Thank you, Grace, and, and thank you to all the fellows for the incredible uh, insights for this research. Um, I just wanna emphasize that, you know, going back to the title, um, engineering to achieve uh, the SDGs is important and the fellowship works toward uh, training holistic engineers that bring um, expertise, the right expertise into the system. We need more ecosystems perspectives as you're seeing here, integrating all the different aspects of um, this type of, of uh, research questions um, and integration of academia, of underground, uh, of nonprofits, of private sector. Uh, we need that holistic perspective to be able to advance in these goals. And with the partnerships, as Grace mentioned, are key to achieve uh, the SDGs. That cross-sectoral collaboration, again, you know, we believe it's, it's, it's very important. And we're doing this through the research collaborations that we just presented to you and through our fellowship program. Uh, I just wanna make sure that I uh, bring to your attention that we have just published the annual research report for 2019, and you can find that, we'll share in the chat now, um, for uh, all the research collaborations that were done last year. We'll be publishing the 2020 annual report in January 2021, so stay tuned for that. You can find the rest of the research collaborations on the links that we just shared. So if you wanna partner with us, uh, email us at partners at engineeringforchange.org. If you wanna be a part of the fellowship uh, program, uh, check out, you know, kind of uh, learn more and sign up to receive more information on the website, as we just mentioned. So without further to say, I just um, want to go to the live Q&A. So I will invite all of our fellows now to join us. Welcome fellows. So if you have not put your question in the Q&A box, uh, be sure to do that. I have a couple of questions here, so I will get started because we just have uh, 10 minutes. Um, the first question uh, that I'm being asked by Dishan Patel is, what advice do you have for freshman university students who look uh, forward to start participating in EGD uh, and do not have much experience working in such sectors? Should, I, should he go ahead and apply for the fellowship? Uh, how, I will pass this one to you. EGD and uh, uh, yeah, I was inspired by the work of uh, previous fellows and uh, their experience. So I would definitely recommend that you apply. And you will definitely learn a lot about EGD in the, during the fellowship. And how is a great example of an engineer uh, that was working in the private sector and ju just transitioned into EGD, so our advice to you is that you do uh, apply 
and, and start entering this sector. We need more engineers uh, to get trained in this field to advance uh, the SDGs. My, the next question that I have here is for Elizabeth and, and Dana. Um, something that struck uh, one of our attendees is that there were not a sustainable sustainability and manufacturing standards. Um, can you share, um, you know, what is it that struck you, Dana and Elizabeth, about this field? And what can you um, tell us um, what, what should be done in the future to set the standard for this field? That's a good question. Um, I think what we found is that there is currently um, a lot of growth in the area for sustainability in industry. And so there's a lot of interest from not only company, but like society in general. Um, there's a lot of light being shed onto social issues at the moment. So um, there's definitely interest in these companies. However, there also isn't really consensus on the right approach. There isn't one right approach. And um, a lot of different companies are finding different ways by developing their own standards. We drew from research um, on experts in the field and uh, based on both academia and industry insights, what really surprises is the complexity of this issue that there isn't really a one size fits all at the moment. And um, the state of the industry is kind of, we're looking at as many different solutions as possible. Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, I think some of the feedback we got is that some of the larger companies are now looking to work together on these things. Um, so kind of within their industries, they are looking to influence suppliers and things like that. So I think that's definitely um, the way forward um, is for the bigger companies to work together. Um, something that was also quite interesting I found was there's a bit of a kind of disparity between um, probably engineers and the kind of academics and management in these companies. Um, I think uh, for engineers, the kind of focus is on time and cost. Um, and not so much the bigger picture on some of the sustainability goals. So I wonder if something like that would be um, helpful going forward if engineers were just as invested and conscious in these things. Excellent, thank you, Dana and Elizabeth. I have another question here. I will leave it open for any of the fellows to answer. From your research, what do engineers feel that they need to be able to understand and to improve sustainability during the design process? And I think, Grace, this is very aligned to you, so <laughs> being non-democratic here. <laughs> um, so the question, able to understand and improve sustainability during the design process. Um, so I think one thing I think is really important is looking at sustainability really holistically. It's often considered in like th three pillars or three um, parts of the social sustainability, the environment, and then the economic. I think there's a lot of emphasis um, you know, the economic sustainability is commonly practiced. We want to cut costs, save money, um, and a lot of our tools are designed to be efficient um, and in increase efficiency in that sense. And then I think the increase in environmental sustainability um, is, is happening. We see that in, excuse me, cutting costs and uh, reducing material, which means reducing waste. Um, but I think one thing that really could be um, improved is the social part. So really thinking about like, what are the impacts on stakeholders? Who are the most vulnerable communities um, being impacted? I think that um, is really needed. Thank you, Grace. And um, this next question um, comes uh, from me to JT and, and Thomas. Uh, they recently presented um, their, this research to the Cambodian government. Um, so my question to you both is, what is it that is needed and for this research to be implemented? And, and what do you think are next steps in this type of research, especially in sanitation solutions that are looked upon down on and are so important? Yeah, thanks, Maria. Um, I think in terms of the next steps, uh, we can touch on first. What, because of the nature of the research, we were very much desk based. We were remote working and communicating with a lot of partners um, in Cambodia, a lot of experts in Cambodia. And there's a lot of opportunities to then move that research when we move into the field to engage with users at the local level. So we're talking a lot about solutions that would benefit users at the local level. And I think that the future work could really encompass them and engage them. There's opportunity to really just better understand the, drive your, the drivers for the behavior change and sanitation solution uptake 
um, and experience their personal experience with the hard rock challenging environments, really focusing in and leaning into that human centered design um, and considerations around those um, engineering solutions. Definitely. And just to build upon JT's point, yeah, um, we did re recognize that the nature of the research is that gap is to really substantiate that model that we were able to develop with the communities or the intended end users and beneficiaries. So that would be, it's that's strategically the next step into really evolve or take the project one step forward. And we believe that working with um, the experts we were able to engage with has provided a baseline for that. So we're just quite excited, excited how, how that would not only translate into Cambodia um, and the sanitation in there, but also wider Southeast Asia. Excellent, JT and Thomas, thank you. I have another question here for Jonathan Kemp and Bertelel. Was there any insight from um, the mango producers themselves for this research? So, um, yeah, uh, one, one interesting thing uh, we found was that in addition to the uh, normal products that are uh, made from the mangoes, like the mango juice and the dried pulp and the others, some farmers had, had also uh, started exploring the use of the mangoes to make mango wine. And they, they do not uh, have the right equipment and the right you know, understanding to be able to do it well enough to have the right markets for it. So with, this, uh, with the insights we gathered uh, from the technologies and the comparisons we've done, we, we hope to be able to uh, provide uh, them the, the right knowledge and the understanding in selecting some, uh, the appropriate technologies for making some of these new products. And it also opens the avenue for uh, upcycling the waste products that they have and using them for other productive materials. Thank you. Thank you, Vatel. We have one more question here, and I think this is related to to the, the previous question. Um, as more research, and this is from Jennifer, as more research and work has shifted online, how do engineers continue to ensure that the social connection is not lost and that solutions are based on community assets and their individual needs? Jonathan, I think I will pass um, this one to sorry. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um... Hi. So important as um, as you said, Jen, to um, uh, to those perspectives from the, the local people in the community, and that can be done through if you're not able to get there in person, speaking to people who work with with those people, whether it's a local um, NGO or nonprofit, um, or whether it's with the the local government there, and they'll either be working directly and just be able to share, you can be able to visit on your behalf the, the people who will be the end users of the product that you're looking to develop or technology that you're looking to implement. And so they may therefore be able to give you some useful insight. The question. I hope it does, but it was a really hard answer. And I think, Jennifer, we're working towards um, you know, connecting the dots so that we're actually listening to all the actors involved in the design of this type of solution. So it's a really good question to end up with before we end up. I really want to address one question that we have in the chat going on and that we get very excited when we see. Um, and this is from uh, James and from Charles. Uh, I just, uh, they're asking if there's uh, the work, um, if there's a role for recently retired practical engineers um, with lesser minds than what I have seen today. Um, and that they are retiring. I just want to invite you all to join Engineering for Change. Uh, engineeringforchange.org has many opportunities uh, for people to connect. And I think Bob was a longtime collaborator and expert advisor. We look for expert advisors and for engineering expertise that can help advance this field. So the answer is yes, and we invite you all to join. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We really hope you enjoy uh, this session, as much as, as we did uh, developing this research, we invite you to visit uh, our website and to check out the research. I want to thank all the fellows for the incredible work. Uh, thank you, Grace, for moderating it. Um, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.